In the UK, in the Peak District, there's a little town called Cromford. In Cromford, there's an old bookshop called Scarthen Books. Scarthen Books is the sort of place that belongs within a story. Over many floors, each space is crammed full of books. They tower all the way up to the tall ceilings. There's books in the staircases and shelves and runners with more books behind. It's endless. There's new books, old books, poetry, art books, music books, children's books, anything you could want. In Scarthen Books, Round a corner, up a flight of stairs, behind a secret bookshelf door, through the cafe, out a back door, up some steps, and across a rooftop garden, there is another room, known as the Lonely Pianist and Foreign Languages Room. This room is a drafty converted shed with two fridges, a piano, and, you guessed it, more books. In the Lonely Pianist and Foreign Languages Room, there are many German books, including one shelf of these little yellow volumes published by Reclaim. In this collection of yellow books, there is one simply titled Gedichte by Heinrich Heine. The book caught my eye because it had been heavily annotated by a previous owner. In a handwriting I can barely parse, I get little ideas such as escapism, not enough, and he's loved me. And in this little yellow book, I found a piece of writing that changed my relationship with German stories and the people of history. I bought it for 50 pence and wandered back to our holiday home where I settled into a cosy couch and began my investigations. I translated Gedichte and found it means poems. Next, I looked up the author on Wikipedia. Heinrich Heine was a German poet from a Jewish family. He was born on the 13th December, 1797, and died the 17th of February, 1856. He lived an interesting life, but the only thing I'm going to tell you is this quote from one of his plays, which was inscribed on one of the sites where the Nazis burned the books over a hundred years later. It reads, Das war ein Vorspiel nur, dort wo man Bücher verbrennt, verbrennt man auch am Ende Menschen. And this translates to, that was but a prelude, where they burned books they will ultimately burn people as well. So, with the vaguest idea about who the author is, I'm left with a book of 200-year-old poems about a time and place in history I know nothing about in a language I'm learning as a hobby. I suspected there would be no way to understand anything within this book. I flipped through randomly, skimming the stanzas and paragraphs for enough words I could grip together to find a scratch of meaning and found myself empty-handed. That is, until in a section dated around 1825, I found a poem called Fragen. The poem attracted me because it is short, only three stanzas long. I also understood the title. Fragen has two meanings. One is questions and the other is to question or to ask. Another reason it caught my eye is because of an annotation the previous owner had added. They simply wrote, warning. Now, I want to take you on this journey of deciphering this poem to see if we can find any connection to this distant past. I'll share with you the words I understand, and we'll see what it's like to piece together the puzzle of language with only some of the parts. Let's dip into that space before understanding, where the spirit of the words comes alive, even while parts of it are still missed. I'll read it to you first in German, and then we'll go back and see, piece by piece, what we can uncover. Here we go. Fragen. Am Meer, am wüsten, nächtlichen Meer, steht ein Jüngling Mann, die Brust voll Wehmut, das Haupt voll Zweifel, und mit düsten Lippen fragt er die Wogen. Ho, oh, löst mir das Rätsel des Lebens, das Quoll für uralte Rätsel, vorüber schon manche Häupter gerübert, Häupter in Hieroglyphen mutzen, Häupter in Türmen und schwarzem Barett, Perückenhäupter und tausend andere, arme, schwitzende Menschenhäupter. Sagt mir, was bedeutet der Mensch? Woher ist er kommen? Wo geht er hin? Wer wohnt dort oben auf goldenen Sternen? Es mormeln die Wogen, ihr ewiges Gemormel. Es wehet der Wind, 
Es fliehen die Wolken, es blinken die Sterne, gleichgültig und kalt, und ein Narr wartet auf Antwort. I should mention, und ein Narr has been triple underlined by our editor, so maybe that's what the warning alludes to. All right, let's get started. So the first line, am Meer. Am Wüsten Mechlichen Meer. So I know Mia means sea, and am means something like at the or by. So putting those in, we've got at the sea, at the Wüsten Mechlichen Sea. We've got two words left, and we can see that each of them has a vowel with two dots above it. What these dots do in German is they add an E sound to whatever vowel they are above. So without the dots, we'd have Wusten and Nachlichen. But with the dots, we have Wusten and Nachlichen. I don't actually know what either of these words mean. I just was excited to talk about the dots. But I can tell you that they're describing the sea, so we don't need them to get a basic idea of the picture. The next line, word for word, can translate to stands a young man. Putting these side by side, you can see some of the common ancestry between German and English. Steht translates to stands, ein translates to a, jungling translates to young or youth, and man translates to man. The next line we have another couple of words that are potentially recognizable, but a bit more distant. Brust sounds a bit like breast, and indeed it is the man's chest. Fall, and note the v making an f sound, fall is the German word for fool. So sticking those in, we've got the chest full of the mut, the haupt full of zweifel. Now you'll see I've added a couple of ofs there. Little words like these, like of or to or for, shift from language to language, both in what they're used for and in even needing them at all. So in German, saying haupt voll zweifel tells us that the Haupt is full of Zweifel, since the context gives us enough information to infer that. But in English, we need to use of to clarify that the Haupt is full of Zweifel, instead of full in Zweifel or full for Zweifel. So I'll be moving around these little words where I need to. Haupt is an old word for head. This is the poem showing its age, since Kopf has mostly replaced Haupt as the popular modern word for head. However, Haupt lives on in words like Hauptstadt, which means capital or head city, or Hauptbahnhof, which means main or head train station. There's an article in the description if you want to read more about this word. What else do we have? Well, we've got D and Das. Now, German has many words for the. D and Das are two of them. Why do you need many words for the? Well, basically, which the is used provides extra information about whatever we are saying the for. I'm not going to get into it here, but all we need to know right now is that D and DAS are both translate to the. So let's stick those in. We have two German words left in this line. Vermut and Zweifel. I don't know what Vermut means, but I happen to know that Zweifel means doubt. So we've ended up with the chest full of vermut, the head full of doubt. And even though we don't know what vermut means, we're building a picture here. We might be able to fill in the blanks if we think creatively. If the head is full of doubt, what feeling could be filling the chest or the heart? And now our last line of the stanza. Und mit dusten Lippen fragt er die Bogen. Here we have some more words with common ancestry. So und uh, translates to and, mit translates to with, and lippen is the word for lips. So and with dusten lips. Um, I don't know what dusten means, but again, we can see a describing word saying something extra about the lips, so we don't need it. We've got a couple of little words we can get rid of. So d we've seen before means the, and er is a word that means he. Fact is related to fragen, which we previously discussed means either questions or to question or to ask. 
From context, it looks like this is the to ask version of the word. But why has the ending changed? German doing words often change a little to give extra information about how they are being used. English does this too, only more rarely. For example, in English, to ask becomes he asks. We have this S. And in the same way in German, to ask is fragen, but he asks is er fragt. However, if we put in our asks, we don't have he asks, we have asks he. The word order here may seem strange to English speakers. We're not going to get into it, but just know that generally in different languages, word order will change to satisfy different rules. Uh, Vogen is a word I have to look up, and it means waves. Put all that together word for word, and what do we have? We have and with Dustin lips asks he the waves. So let's read over our first stanza to regain our bearings. At the sea. At the Wusten Nechlichen Sea stands a young man, the chest full of the moot, the head full of doubt, and with Dustin lips asks he the waves. So the scene is set, and we're all ready for the questions. The namesake of the poem is gonna come out in this stanza. Here's the next two lines. Oh, Lös mir das Rätsel des Lebens, das qualvoll uralte Rätsel. Pretty dramatic. The words are dramatic, not just me acting the words. So first characters first. The German opening speech mark is different than the English one, and so is the ending one, but we'll just swap those out to the English ones now, and we can move on. Das is a word for the that we've seen before. And using O like this is a pretty universal cry for help or call of despair. You know, like, oh, mir is a word for me that more specifically implies that whatever is happening affects me or something is happening to me. Let's chuck in that very literal definition of to me for now and we'll come back to this. Lust is a form of the word lusen, which means to solve. The ending is changed again, similarly to fragen, changing to fragt. However, although it does look the same, this time the change means that this is an instruction. In English, to give an instruction, we just say the word like an instruction, like ask or solve it. So we can just put in solve here. The Rätsel appears twice, and this is a word I had to look up, which means puzzle. Leben means life. But here we don't have Leben, we have Leben's with an S. What is the S doing there? Good question. Well, the word before, des, is another word for the. But it, along with the S being added to Leben, adds the idea of ownership. The des could be directly translated to of the or of in English. And the added S is similar to what we do in English to show what has ownership. For example, in English, you could say the sword of the knights, to say the sword that belongs to the knight, or the knight's sword. We don't always add the S in English, for example, the population of Britain. And they don't always add the S in German, depending on the word, but they do for Leben. So to apply those rules, here that gives us something like the puzzle of lives. Whew. All right, that was a dense bit. But let's put it together and see what we've got. Oh, solve to me the puzzle of life's, the qualful uralte puzzle. Now we can just about figure out what this means from here, but this is a prime example of how word for word translation can become confusing. To translate the first line less directly, since we don't have a direct mere equivalent in English, we need a different way to get across this idea that what is happening affects me. Often adding a two does an okay job of this, but it doesn't seem to work in this example. This comes into what I was talking about before with these little words like to or of moving around and sometimes appearing and disappearing from language to language. In German, the mir is enough to imply how what is happening affects me. But in English, we need to add more information with the little words. To do this, we can put a four in there. 
On the second half, to describe belonging in English, it'd be more natural to say, instead of the puzzle of life's, something like life's puzzle. And the word order is a little strange for English, so let's move things around to suit us. That lands us on, oh, solve life's puzzle for me. Which is clearer to understand, although I now feel we've lost some of the poetic rhythm. This is how things get lost in translation. Let's make a couple of creative decisions and go for, oh, solve for me the puzzle of life. Great. Bang those. Let's move on to the next five lines. Vorüber schon manche Häupter gerübert. Häupter in Hieroglyphen mützen, Häupter in Turban und schwarzen Barett, Perückenhäupter und tausend andere. Arme, schwitzende Menschenhäupter. The word Häupter appears a lot. We've already seen that Haupt is a word for head. We see the word Häupter appear many times in this stanza. Häupter is plural of Haupt. So, heads. We have some uns, which we've seen before means and, and a couple of ins, which is the same word in both languages, give or take. Wo rüber is a combination of where, wo, and über, over. So, where over. Schon can mean lots of different things, and I'll put an article about it in the description, but here basically means already. I'll skip Manchu, and I don't know what gerübelt means. But I can tell it's a doing word from context, and we can tell that it is in the past from our shon. So we're over already, mancha heads go rubelt. Next line, heads in, and then some long, scary German word that I don't know. But long German words are often a combination of smaller words, and actually the first part of this word is recognizable with the English translation. Hieroglyphen. Looks a lot like hieroglyphics. So, heads in some sort of hieroglyphics? Next, we have a couple of words that look straight out of English. Heads in turban and heads in some sort of barret. Gonna assume turban is the same and that barret is beret. While we're on the hat theme, apparently. Next line. We've got another long word I don't know, but we can again check if it's broken into parts we recognize. And indeed, the second part is a word we've seen a bunch of times by now, Häupter. So another sort of heads. Next we've got tausend. This word looks strange, but hearing it aloud may make the English relative more obvious. Tausend. That's the German word for thousand. Andere is also similar to the English, and this is a word for other. With the last line of this chunk, we can see Häupter as part of a bigger word, so we can split our word up again. Menschen Häupter, Menschen Heads. Menschen means people, so that gives us Arme, Schwitzende, People Heads. If you've ever heard of German as having a reputation for just mashing words together, it's because of things like this. Although I get the impression that this is a more poetic use of the language than you would expect to hear in everyday chat. So let's put those five lines together. We're over already, mancha heads gerubelt. Heads in hieroglyphics mutzen. Heads in turban and schwarze embere. Perukin heads and thousand other. Arme, schwitzende people heads. Now, this is frustrating, and this is just a situation that happens all the time for me. Sometimes you get so much out of a sentence. So many of the parts to play with, but you don't get some critical word. Here, we can get the picture of all these heads from all these places and times doing gerubelting. And I have no idea what that means. But here, we can hope to guess from context of within this poem called Questions, talking about the puzzle of life, amusing that so many people from all over time have done this thing, we can guess it's a word for thinking in some way. Although I know the word to think, and it is denken. So it's probably a slightly fancier word like ponder or muse or ruminate. You know, the sort of word you don't learn when you're beginning to learn a language. 
But the not knowing opens up the spirit of the poem to let any of these meanings fill that space. What would you say is the word to describe what people do in their heads through all these times and places when confronted with being trapped within the puzzle of life? The next three lines finally tell us what the questions are. So for the first line, sabbed is like say, but this is the command form again. So it works more like tell. Mir, we've seen before, means something is happening to me, which backs up this tell command. So this is like say to me or tell me. Vas is what. Bedeutet means means. Der is another word for the. And mensch means person, singular of mention. Put that all together and we've got tell to me. What means the person? And to do my own word for word translation of the next two lines. Where from is he come? Where does he go to? Who lives there above of golden stars? Or to translate less literally, tell me, what is the meaning of a person? Where does he come from? Where does he go? Who lives there over the golden stars? Let's go one more time from the top and I'll end with my partial translation of the last stanza. At the sea, at the Wüsten, Nechlichen See, stands a young man. The chest full of vermut, the head full of doubt, and with distant lips asks he the waves. Oh, so for me the puzzle of life, the quadful uralte puzzle, where over already mensche heads go about, heads in hieroglyphic mutsin. Heads in Turban and Schwarz and Beret, Perukin heads, and thousand other. Arme, Schwitzende people heads. Tell me, what is the meaning of a person? Where does he come from? Where does he go? Who lives there over the golden stars? It mormel the waves, their eternal gemormel. It may hit the winds, it flay in the clouds, it blink in the stars, gleich gotig und cold. And a fool waits for an answer. In a random, obscure place, I found a book in a different language from a different time. I expected to understand nothing, but I found a beautiful painting of the fight that so many of us have to fight as part of the human condition. The friction between our internal need for meaning against the endless blankness of the universe. And this is where foreign language stops being about learning the words or grammar differences or all the different words for the. This is where another language becomes understanding and ideas. This is where we draw meaning from the foreignness and tie it together and find something relatable and human. My head is another in the chorus, asking the waves why we're here. Regardless of if you have an answer or not, there is something comforting about knowing that when you stand there, heads from hieroglyphics, heads in turban and heads in beret, heads of those who annotate their books and heads of German poets from 200 years ago, have all stood before those ways too. Godspeed and thanks for watching.